that today because the last three sermons I have given have been about enduring in faith, hope, and love, and helping us to realize that in faith, sometimes there's a great deal of pain involved in faith. The, the, the pain, for example, that Abraham had to go through when he was asked by God to sacrifice his son, he went through all of that. That was an incredible amount of pain on his, his behalf. We think about that, and even when we endure in hope, we're hoping something will come to pass, and hope is always positive, but we have to sometimes endure that. Uh, there's stretches of time in that in our hope, we hope that it'll be, this will happen to us. And then, of course, we think we endure in love, and that is, in love, we make sacrifices for one another. Uh, we. We do things for one another, and we do it not because we have to, but rather because we want to, and that is the way in which to live. But I didn't want to leave you with that alone, because if you and I are going to live the rest of our life out enduring in faith, hope, and love, I believe we're going to miss a lot of things, but I did want us to at least think about this other aspect of faith, hope, and love, because Jesus tells us in the Olivet Prophecy that he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. But today I want to talk about enjoying faith, hope, and love. Because I believe it rounds it out in a way that we may not think about it. And the joy that we ought to have because we have faith, because we have hope, and we have love. Now... The scripture, of course, that we're focusing on has been 1 Corinthians chapter 13. and verse 13, easy always to remember, because the Apostle Paul is addressing a church that I think all of us can relate to in a way, the Corinthian church. And this is his first letter to the Corinthian church. They're a church that is very cosmopolitan. They're a church very involved in love in the sense they had temples, they had, uh, you know, prostitution going on in the temple, lifestyles that were really idolatrous, lifestyles that were really covetous, lifestyles that really spoke to the way in which the world is. And Jesus contrasting the life that we live, which is a different world because his kingdom is not of this world. And then the, in all of that, these people, these Corinthians, were very, as we would say, cosmopolitan. They felt like they knew a lot of things. They had a lot of gifts, abilities, and talents, and the like. And in the midst of that, the Apostle Paul says, you can have all these gifts that you want. However, if you do not have this ultimate one, he ends up in verse 13, the ultimate gift of love, the greatest among these. But these other two characteristics that go with love, faith and hope and love. So he concludes his message on how to live in Christ. Now, I, I say in Christ because living in faith, living in hope, and living in love without God, without Jesus, and without the Holy Spirit misses the mark. Because without God, how long do we live in faith, hope, and love? Well, for some of us, as we grow older, we have a... Not too long period of time, 20, maybe 25 years, and that's the end of our life, and that's it. And if we don't pack in, in those few years that we have left, all the fun that we can have and all that we can possibly do and the like, then that's it, it's over. However, on the other end, and we do it our way. We do it like Frank Sinatra. You know, I did it my way, I, you know, and I'll continue to do it our way. But in our case, it's like, no, wait a minute. We do this God's way, directed by the Spirit, directed and understanding Christ Jesus in our life. So the life, the message that Paul is giving is how to live life in Christ. And he's talking about these three qualities that make life a joy beyond our expectations. Now, this is the beauty of understanding who God is. Something that is beyond your greatest expectations. 
So Karen and I, she, Karen was talking about our trip to the Caribbean for our 25th anniversary. Now, I, I have a greater appreciation for eternal life and being married to my wife for 25 years because it has gone like the time didn't exist. It was, this has been the most enjoyable 25 years of my life, living with a woman that I trust, that I have hope in, and that I love. So God has taught me and is teaching me, and I hope all of us, lessons about life, even in our relationships with one another. So these qualities help us to enjoy the present and to see the glorious future that we have. The, this is what empowers us in our problems and also in the promises that we have set before us. Now, so that when I talk about enjoying faith, hope, and love, this is out of the realm of possibilities and it's certainly within the scope of what Jesus himself tells us how our life ought to be. So I want to read what Jesus' words were when he's talking about guiding us, directing us, and shepherding us. This is from John 10, and we'll begin here in verse 9 and 10 of John 10. And here's what Jesus says to us in verse 9. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Now that's a very positive statement. It also telling us how to enter in. He will come in and go out and find pasture. Now, coming in and coming, going out shows a, a freedom that we have because you, you li you're able to go out, you're able to enjoy, and you will find pasture coming in and going out because you belong, and God wants us to know that we belong. He says, now, on the other hand, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now, he mentions these three things because Jesus is contrary to all three of these things, of stealing, of killing, of destroying. He says, I have come that you may have life, but not only life, that you may have it to the full. So when we were there and we visited the Mayan ruins and we hear the history of and we see how things were done as best archaeologists could put together. We recognize that there are tribal chieftains and in all of their thinking, these men were God. And they had power over life and death. And if you cross them, you know, off with your head immediately. That's the life and death and the power. Now, when we think about that God has come, Jesus has come, that we might have life and we might have it more abundantly, we recognize our relationship with the power, the, the one who has all power in heaven and earth is a relationship that is totally different, one that brings to us life and joy and peace. So Jesus is telling us that he, his promise is for us to have life and have it to the full, and that... He is suggesting that in our relationship in the present, that we have life with him and we have it abundantly. And this life is led by the Spirit of God. So let's take a look at these because faith, hope, and charity are spiritual gifts that God gives to us. And there is a diversity within the Spirit that God has given to us. So I want to in, in looking at this, I want us to take a look at the spiritual gifts as the Apostle Paul addresses them in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which is leading up to 1 Corinthians 13, 13, where he talks about these are the three things that are major and most important. So he's, he tells the, the church there in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, now about spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagan somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray by mute idols. Now, again, having an appreciation and being able to be in a, in a place and a time going back century plus, century, millennia plus, we recognize that in terms of idols, everything that they worshipped 
and they worshiped everything as a god and it had influence and when God was not pleased with them, they made sacrifice and they made human sacrifice because they're always concerned that God is not pleased with them and that by sacrificing uh, the innocent, uh, that supposedly that God would be pleased with the sacrifice that they had made. And we look at the sacrifice that God calls us to make today and realize, wow, that's, it's, it's quite different than that. And our relationship is quite different. It says, therefore, I tell you, no one who is speaking by the Spirit says God, of God says that Jesus is cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, this is important for us to understand how that we're led by the Holy Spirit a recognition, if we're going to enjoy faith, we have to understand who Jesus is and the relationship that we have with Jesus and the relationship that Jesus has with his heavenly father. If we're going to enjoy faith. So we recognize the difficulty and Jesus recognized that difficulty and we recognize the, the smallness of our faith because Jesus tells us this. If you had faith of a grain of mustard seed, a little bit, you could move mountains. And you think, yeah, right. I can move mountains. That, you know, it isn't, doesn't quite work that way. But the reality is, yes, if we just had a little bit of faith. So when we think, and I'll kind of move faith a little forward into hope, as it were, imagine for a moment if you, what, how your life would be so different if you had faith. If you had faith, you could step out of the boat and walk on water. If you had faith, you, when we're going down this jungle river and they're saying there are crocodiles in there, I'm thinking, I don't want to fall out of the boat. I don't want to become crocodile bait and the like. And yet I see in a couple cases young fellows out there in the river swimming thinking, what, you know, this doesn't look very smart to me. There's crocodiles in this, this place and the like. But they, I guess they had a certain confidence that they weren't going to be eaten by crocodiles. I wasn't of that same kind of confidence. As you well know, if I had faith, I wouldn't be so concerned about heights. So when I'm like, we're on the top of this pyramid, looking out over Belize and the like, looking towards Honduras and Guatemala, because you could see so far, I wouldn't feel so nervy about these, these kind of things if I had a little bit of faith. If I had faith, I guess I could ascend up, but I, I'm too heavy. My, my faith is too weak and my weight is too much and I'm not ascending up and I'm not, you know, th these are kind of, just imagine for the moment how different your life, our, all of our lives would be if we had faith, if we had the faith of Jesus. We wouldn't worry about tomorrow. We'd, we'd not be worried about anything. And it is important because one of the things about faith that we have to recognize and one of the things about the kingdom that God has called us to, he says that in his kingdom, one, two things about faith and fear. One is this, that the fearful and the unbelieving have no place in the kingdom of God. So faith is about not being fearful and also believing in God that he can do what he has promised us to do even though we don't fully understand all that he has promised to do. But we have this one understanding about it. It is beyond our greatest expectation. And think, well, well, I can expect a lot. No, it's beyond your expectation. We find it hard to believe that it could be beyond what we expect. But it is. So then he goes on to say about this. He says, we can't know this except God through the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working by the same 
God works in all of them and in all men. Though each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And we have to believe in that by faith. It isn't just about us. It's for the common good that we have gifts, the gifts that are given to us. To one, there is giving through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. So we find even faith is a gift from God. And it's something that we can enjoy because there is an incredible joy about being able to trust. And all we have to do is think about situations where we don't trust and realize how much that robs us of our joy. So my wife gets up on the last morning before we're getting ready to leave. She walks in there, I've got coffee ready, and she looks at me and says, oh, you look worried. Of course I'm worried. I don't know what I'm going to do exactly. I've got to catch a, a, a golf cart, to catch a water taxi, to catch a cab, to catch a plane that's in a different country, to get through customs and to get back home. Yes, because that's who I am, a bit of a worry wart when I don't know exactly how that is going to go. And I'm trying to, so she says, of course, you probably want to leave early. Why? What, what are you? Well, obviously I want to leave early. How early? I want to go get there before I leave, kind of early. And, and wait in the airport. I don't have a problem with that. But she knows me. And this is the thing about God. He knows us. He knows that we have our weaknesses when it comes to really trusting him in the way that we need to trust him. So Paul is telling them, and he is an, he's trying to be an example. He says, follow, this is 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, follow me as I follow Christ. It is helpful in faith to have examples of people who have confidence in God. Now, in our own little physical world, it's like it is so nice to have faith in people who know what they're doing or who have gone there before. So if you're traveling with someone and they're, they, they've been there before, they can tell you what to do, and how to do it, then that gives you a sense of confidence. It's amazing how we can believe in that. I know that when I was trying to make the arrangements for the trip, nothing was going right. I found that I was going to land in, in uh, Belize City, but there wasn't a plane or any, how, how am I going to get over to the island because we're staying on an island? And what is the timing involved in all of those things? And, and how will this work? And how much does it cost? I'm doing all these things, machinations in my own head. And then I call this girl who's a concierge down there. It says, oh, here's, here, I'll send you all these things. Here's what you do. Here's where you go. This is how much it costs. Here's the schedule for all of that. It's like, yeah, now I know. And I feel different. This is how when we trust God and we have faith in him, he knows because he has been there before. So we're followers of Christ. And in faith, well, when we think about enjoying faith, enjoying entrusting our life to him, we look at the fruits of the spirit, their love, their joy, their peace. So God wants us to enjoy in faith. You should have been on the boat ride with us going down the jungle river with this guy. I mean, this river winds here and there, and there's things sticking up there, and it's, it's a jungle river. He's got a 200-horse Yamaha engine on the back of this thing, and he is flying down the river. He's cutting corners here, and the boat's turned this way, the boat's turned that way. He's thinking, well, there could be another boat coming. He's taking a shortcut. There's things going over, and there's stumps and all kinds. He knows where he's going. I'm along for the ride. And I'm thinking, I hope you know where you're going. Because otherwise, 
So when we think about Jesus, our life does get a little exciting at times in faith. But we have the fruit of the Spirit knowing God does that. So in these previous sermons, I've talked about faith in terms of enduring it in difficult times. Now I'm going to talk, again, talk about faith, hope, and love, though, and in the joy of it. So let's take a look at how the Apostle Paul frames this joy of faith in Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, some encouraging words by the Apostle Paul helping us to understand. He says, in verse uh, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints at Ephesus, the faithful in Christ, peace and grace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, a reassuring, a comforting, giving us, help us to trust in who that we're talking who we have faith in. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Where do these blessings come? They come from heaven. They, they are through Christ Jesus. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Now talk about increasing our trust in God. This is, he chose, chose us before the foundation. His desire and his purpose is that we be holy and blameless in his sight. Which, you know, I, he's the one who matters how we appear. So it's in his sight. In love, he has predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. All of these things are good. All of these things are positive. All of these things we can trust in. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. This is what God has done in the one he loves. So he expresses this positive relationship with God. Spiritual blessings in high places in Christ, without blame before him in love, according to his good pleasure and good will, we're accepted in his beloved. And then he says of, of us in verse 12, he reminds us of this in terms of trust and faith. In order that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to his praise for his glory. That again, who first trusted in Christ. Now, let's think about a person who first trusted in Christ Jesus and hoped in him and did it in a very difficult situation and that would be the thief on the cross. Here's a man dying, seeing Jesus, but he trusted in him and said, Lord, remember me when you come to, into your kingdom. Psalm, the psalmist tells us here, and I'm just going to refer to this in Psalms 511. He says, those who trust in God rejoice. So enjoy faith, enjoy trusting in him, enjoy the adventure, because you see, our guide trusts in his heavenly father, and we can trust in him because he's been there, he's done that, and he knows where he's going. So we rejoice in faith. It goes on to tell us, the apostle Peter also says the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. So I'm done just leaving it to the Apostle Paul, but to all apostles and, of course, to all of his people, all of his disciples as well. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, we read this here, and we're reminded of this in verse 6, where it says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine, and then the result, and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. This is the other thing about faith, is that we have a trust in not only in the presence of what we do, but there is will be an unveiling of that glory and honor at the appearing of Christ Jesus. So we, this is trust as opposed to paranoia. 
Now, if you understand what paranoia is, people are afraid of everything. and They're looking over their shoulder and they're seeing things that aren't there and there is no trust. And none of those things happen. And it's a mental health issue, but it also can be an issue of life. I was reading, one of the books that I was reading had to deal with a criminal and it was talking about, oh, it was Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. This is from a book that we found in the library where we were staying, uh, and it was on the Andes and the different parts of the Andes and times and people. But it was talking about Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid who ended up in Bolivia, ended up getting killed in Bolivia because they, bank robberies they had done and they finally caught up with them. But one of the things that Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid is said, you can never, ever be at peace because you're always looking over your shoulder. And they tried to get far enough away that they would never be looking over their shoulder, which they didn't, and the like. Now, brethren, when we think about who we have faith in who Jesus is and what he has done, we don't have to be looking over our shoulder because we trust him and we look forward to the future. And we press on towards the prize of the high calling that God has given to us. We also rejoice in faith because we know what God has done for us. And for that, I I continually come back to Hebrews chapter 12, where it says Jesus is the center of our trust. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is working in us. He's begun the work in us. He is the finisher of that. And then it says, for the joy that is set before him, he endured. We trust in what God has done for us, and we have faith in him. We have faith that he can resurrect us from the dead. He, we have faith that he can resurrect us from the kind of spiritually dead, even feel, feeling emotionally or dead in our life. He can resurrect us from that discouragement, that depression, that hopelessness, that helplessness, he, he does that because he has given us our beginning and he gives us our end. And we look at who did it, who he was, and how he did those things, and we have faith. So we enjoy faith. It is so nice to trust. If you do, And I always use this example because it's one of those things in my, my past an old vehicle that you can't trust. You can't trust the brakes, you can't trust the gas gauge, you can't trust the steering wheel. As this friend of mine was driving down the road and he was driving with another passenger and the other passenger was being a kind of a backseat driver not knowing that the steering wheel would come off and so he just took the steering wheel off as they're driving down the road and handed it to him. Fortunately, he had a boxed-in wrench that he had over the bolt and was driving it with that. But, you know, it's like that changes your tune when all of a sudden you say, oh, I'll do the driving, leave the driving to us. Anyhow, there is great joy in trusting God. Great joy. There is great joy in trusting the relationship we have with God. And it's like in marriage. When you have trust in a marriage, there is great joy and there is great peace. Then you enjoy hope. Enjoying the hope that we have. You ever hope, hope, for example, that someone would call? You'd like to hear from them? That someone would call? Well, I'm reminded of this uh, because it's in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18. It it talks about the hope of our calling. And I'm, I'm just, the hope that I have in life, the hope that I have in this day, the, the, the hopes that I have for tomorrow, the hopes that I have for the future, and those expectations that are beyond my hopes. I hope always to be a friend of Jesus. I hope to know him better. I hope to hear from him. And, and we do, you know, when we think about hearing from him, it is God working his will in, in, his, in our lives from day to day. We, brethren, abound in hope. 
And I want to refer to what Paul wrote in the book of Romans chapter 15 and verse 13 because he speaks about the hope that we have and abounding in hope. Romans chapter 15 and verse 13, here's what the, Paul, the apostle Paul says to Gentiles whose past was checkered, to say the least, apart from God. And he's talking about their rejoicing. And then he ends in verse 13 with by saying, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. So what, what is he? The God of all hope. God gives us hope. And I like to refer to the fact that I know people oftentimes live in, in, in relationships that aren't exactly what they want them to be and you keep hoping it'll get better and the like. And I keep reminding all of us that we have a hope for the most incredible, loving relationship ever known. And that is the relationship that we have with Jesus in the fullness of the kingdom of God. We have a hope of seeing our Heavenly Father. Can you think about, when we think about pain and suffering, and you, and you see the, the hope of the world. Well, we're in Belize, and beyond the wall there, it's a third world country. And you think, it changes how you pray, thy kingdom come. You have hope that these people will have the blessings of God. Their lives would just flourish. You want all mankind, hope for all mankind to come to know Christ and government rulers and all of that, that it would be done the way God would want it to be done. So he says, may the God of hope fill all of you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us incredible hope and encouragement. So with that thought in mind, let's take a look at how that hope looks like in Romans chapter 5, because the Apostle Paul is a man of a great and incredible hoping, hoping in Christ. So he writes this to the church at Rome. Therefore, and he's talking about things that God has done that give us hope. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, that is, we're trusting in God and Jesus, we have peace with God. You know, when I look at these ancient societies, there was no peace with God. They were always terrified of that. But we have peace with God but how would we do that? Through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice. We rejoice. This is in joy. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Wow. It's, what do we, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. We know that because, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because he goes on, does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Hope leads us to understanding love. You know, I was talking about, I hope to be Jesus' friend. The, the hope of knowing the love of God, which is what eternal life is about, knowing that. And knowing that you live in relationship. A, a hope for the future that that relationship will even get better than you ever expected it to be. We grow older. And for those who love one another, who trust one another, who care about one another, there's things that you learn. You thought, I, I never knew and understood that. And it's kind of like Karen and I have talked about, you know, we, in a way, we look forward to growing old together. We also look forward to the hope of a relationship with God and with one another that lasts for all eternity. An incredible hope. So he says here, we, we hope because the love of God is poured abroad in our heart 
by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has a part to play in the hope which we have. So we hope in that relationship. And then, so we're enjoying faith, trusting in God. We're enjoying the hope that we have, which is beyond our greatest expectation. And then, brethren, we enjoy the love of God. And enjoying the love of God is an ever-presence in, in our lives. Always the love of God. Loved in faith and loved in hope. In faith, we know he loves us. We can trust him. Why can we trust him? Because God gave his only beloved son, who should ever believe in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. We have faith in that. We have hope, the hope of the sons of God. He calls us things that are not as though they are. He, you know, we, we hope and we think he calls us holy and blameless in his sight. So God's love for us individually and collectively. So you say, well, yes, but it's not my word. Let's take a look at what Jesus said in this regard. Enjoying the love of God. Is this what God wants? Is this what the Holy Spirit wants in our life? Is this what Jesus wants? Does Jesus want us to know the love of the Father? Does Jesus want us to know his love? Does Jesus want to bring us into that kingdom? Well, John chapter 17 and verse 23, here's what Jesus has to say to, to us. He says, I and them and you and me, may they be brought into complete unity to let the world know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Now this takes faith and a belief in God, that God, our Father, loves us as he loved Jesus. Is what Jesus is telling us right here in John. He says, Righteous Father, verse 25 of John 17, Though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. And I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known, in order that the love that you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them, that God's love would be in us. So what does it take us to convince us to enjoy the love of God? I'm telling you, brethren, to enjoy the love of God. I'm so reminded, again, of Romans chapter 8, where it talks about our spirit unites with God's spirit, and there's a, there's a response, there's a reaction whereby we cry, Abba, Father. It's an expression of love. So quickly, let's read a little bit about this love that is beyond our expectation. In Ephesians, again, and Ephesians is an incredible example of looking to the future, the hope that is beyond our ability to comprehend. But I love the way the Apostle Paul has put this because anyone who who has encountered something or somebody that loves them. We talk about getting weak in the knees, as it were. It we just kind of weakens us and we and the like. So for the, here's how Paul puts it. Verse 14 of Ephesians 3. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom the whole family in heaven and earth derives its name. It's just like, I can't help myself. I just... I collapse, as it were, before God for the whole family. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Wow, you talk about touching a heart. And so, you know, when I we, we sing that song, Here I Am, Lord, I love the ending. And, and it's, you know, where it says, I will always hold the people, not in my hand, but in my heart. I will always hold in our spirit and our inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Again, we find these connected. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp. Now this is the to comprehend. Comprehend 
how wide, how long, how high, and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. This isn't about being smart. This is beyond our knowledge that surpasses knowledge. And that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Can you imagine for a moment to being filled with the fullness of God? I mean, Paul put this a little different in same thing, but a little different in Ephesians, Philippians 2 5. Let this mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus. So for a moment, think about having the heart and the mind of Christ and the love of God, and to know how much he loves you, and savor his love. I'm reminded of when Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus, and he wept there, and the people said this of Jesus. Oh, how he loved him. And Jesus says to you and to me as well, Oh, how he has loved us. Brethren, we live life. We enjoy, enjoy the love of God. The love he has for you. The love that is personified in Christ Jesus our Lord. The love that is shown, and, and God is trying to tell us even about his love when he talks about the future of the marriage of the bride and the celebration of that. The love that is shown in fellowship that we have with one another. The love that when our spirit meets his spirit, we're just melt at the love of God to enjoy that love. So when we think about our lives, brethren, and we think about faith, hope, and love. Think not only about in helping us to endure in difficult times, but in this moment of time, and then for all eternity, because in all eternity, you and I are going to be enjoying faith. We're going to be enjoying the hope. And we're going to be enjoying the love of God. And my prayer for all of you is that you will enjoy faith, hope, love, now and forever and ever. Amen. Let's conclude in prayer. Father, we thank you so very much for your blessings, for your love, for your son, which personifies faith, hope, and love. To your glory and praise, and in his name we give you thanks. Amen. Feeling the blues today, or tired of life already? Do you have questions about life, or need spiritual advice? The Worldwide Church of God is located in Fairfield, Santa Rosa, and Modesto, California. We welcome everyone to attend our worship services with us every week at the times listed on your screen.